My turn. We're on page 60, section 3.1. We have to do two sections today. So I'm going to move somewhat quickly. Can you open the board? Yeah, it's kind of dark. Grab the glasses. Switch. Switch. Yeah. Like really. We pull that back. Please. We pull the blind up. Oh, I think Hey, there's an oasis in the desert. Hey. Is it really? Don't yell me. Don't let me go up there. Page sixty. Don't get to me either. I really will come up. she's hit. Taylor. Be quiet, please. Heather, what is it? We don't have time for this. Cowboys, All right, we're talking about um, members of the community here. And this is a graph, it's on the bottom of page 61. And it's um, showing you a graph for what we call range of tolerance. Organisms do best in certain environments. And to refer to that, we use this term range of tolerance. For instance, we can think about um, temperature. And this is a temperature graph. As you go further left, that's colder. And you can see the temperatures here, 9, 13 degrees Celsius. By the way, 0 degrees Celsius is freezing. And room temperature, where, uh, where we like it, is about 20 degrees Celsius. So you can see this certain type of fish, they're called steelhead fish, they have an optimum temperature they like to live at. This is the number of steelhead trout. And you can see the temperature they like to live is right in between 13 Celsius and 21 Celsius. So we're talking probably about 17 is their favorite temperature. And that's where you get at, at 17 degrees, you would find the most steelhead trout. Probably pretty useful idea if you're a fisherman. You might want to check the temperature of the water when you're fishing for these things and go to temperatures that are about 17. That's where the most of them are. You can see they don't do very well below 13. We call that the zone of physiological stress. Stress meaning they have a tough time. Um, they also have a tough time above 21. And at 25, you just don't find any. And below 9, you just don't find any. That's too cold for them. So you see this type of curve. Have you ever seen a curve like this before? Yeah. Yeah. What's it called? Bell, bell. That's a bell curve. And we see it often with organisms. All organisms have uh, ranges of tolerance, not just for temperature, but for amount of water, uh, pressure, um, things like uh, amount of uh, sunlight. You know, you'll, you'll get a curve for, for all different sorts of uh, environmental factors. So it talks about that for a bit. And then on page 62, it goes into uh, an idea that we call succession. Ecological succession is how an area changes over time. And if we take a field that's been cleared, for instance, if you come back in, in um, a month, you see some grasses that grow, growing. And then you come back in another year, you see some shrubs growing. And you come back in another year, you see some big bushes. And then maybe another 10 years later, it's more like a forest. The area changes over time. It doesn't always stay the same. And we call that ecological succession. And there are different stages. You have your pioneer species, like lichens and small plants, herbs and grasses. Small organisms that don't need a whole lot of nice fertile soil to grow. Maybe they don't need a whole lot of water. Um, those are your first organisms. Uh, they're, they're Travel through the, they, they travel through the air by seeds and spores, and they can reach places that have never been colonized. Um, we call those the pioneer species, the first species there. And then over time, their dead bodies decay, and there's some nutrients in the soil. And larger organisms can grow, larger, longer living organisms, grasses, shrubs, shade-intolerant trees. 
now we're getting bigger organisms because the soil has been made fertile by these guys. And then they're dead, they die and their bodies, uh, their nutrients go into the soil and even larger organisms can grow there. So it kind of takes time for this whole community to turn over. And what do we call that again? Succession. Ecological succession. Little video Over footage. time, rocks weather and soil forms. In a primary succession, lichens and mosses, known in this case as pioneer species, take hold. In a secondary succession, new soil formed from dead pioneer species allows for the establishment of small meaty plants, small ferns, fungi, and insects. As these organisms die, more soil builds. Seeds carried into the area by water, wind, or animals begin to grow. After some time, succession slows down and the community reaches equilibrium. This stable, mature community is called a climax community. So we start with pioneer species, we go to climax community. We have words called primary succession and secondary succession. Primary succession refers to the formation of soil. Listen up, y'all. In an area where there's no soil, you have to do what's called primary succession and form the soil. If it's just bare rock, the organisms that move in there like lichens, they attach to the rock and they kind of eat it away and make dirt out of it. And their dead bodies put nutrients in it. And that takes a long time. So areas that don't have any soil becoming a forest, we call that primary succession. Areas that already have soil, like if, if they clear a field, they take a farmland and they clear it, there's soil already there, so you'll get plants relatively quickly. That's called secondary succession. Secondary succession occurs in places where there's already soil. Primary succession occurs in places where there's no soil yet. Let me ask you a question. Volcano blows out a bunch of lava and there's lava spread all over the place. What kind of succession is going to occur, occur there? Primary succession primary. or secondary? Primary. primary succession. No soil yet. Question number two. Forest fire comes through a place. Wrecks everything. Burns everything. There's nothing left. What kind of succession is going to occur there? Primary or secondary? Secondary. secondary there's already soil. And it'll grow back real quick. Old Walmart parking lot that has been abandoned. Primary, Primary or secondary? Primary. 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 These are questions that have come up on the next test. Here's about how long it takes to establish everything. You don't reach a mature forest for up to hundreds of years from a burned out forest. Interesting. Okay, so that was 3.1 real fast. The next section is 3.2. 3.2 talks about the earth and the different biomes there are on the earth. Have you ever heard that word before, biomes? Yeah. Biomes are major types of areas, like tropical rainforest, desert, grassland, tundra. There are major, there are different areas on the globe where things live, and we call them biomes. And the reason why areas of the globe are different is partly because the earth is round. See, the sunlight, because the earth is round, the sunlight affects the earth in different ways. There's less sunlight hitting at the poles because the sun is at a high angle, coming in at an angle. There's a lot more sunlight at the equator because the sun is coming straight in and hitting it directly. In the morning when you wake up, it's not very hot because the sun's at a very low angle. But when it gets overhead, because the earth is spinning, it's, it's more straight on and it's a lot hotter. So the same thing with the equator. The sun's straight on, so it's hotter at the equator. So the earth being round, distributes the sun unevenly. And that's one reason some places have different biomes than others. But there's a lot of other factors. There's moisture, the amount of rainfall. We tend to get a lot of rainfall at the equator. 
we tend to get very little rainfall at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitudes. This is difficult to understand. But if you're a weatherman, you know this very well. Because it's so hot at the equator, Sophie, you getting any of this? Mm -hmm. Because it's so hot at the equator, the hot air rises and cools and drops all its rainfall. So you get a ton of rainfall at the equator. And then the air, now dry, moves, moves this way, moves higher or lower latitude. Are you all with me? I feel like we're not. I am. Okay. Hot air at the equator rises up in the atmosphere, drops all its rainfall, so we get a lot of rain out, out by the equator, spreads out after it drops its rain, and falls back down toward the earth at about 30 degrees north and south latitude. So this is air that has lost all its rain, so it's dry. And when it comes down to the earth, it pulls all the moisture away from the ground, and so your deserts fall at 30 degrees north and south latitude. You get the same sort of effect up here where the air is rising and then spreading out and falling, but it's not as great. Um, and so it, it's, it's a very complicated system. You add into that the seasons, the earth going around the sun. You add into that the various continents being the shapes that they are. And you get a very complicated weather system on the planet. But the type of biome it is is basically caused by two factors, temperature and rainfall. If we have high temperature and high rainfall, we get tropical rainforests in those areas. What do you think you have if you have high temperature and low rainfall? That's a desert. High temperature, low rainfall. Desert. What about low temperature, low rainfall? Tundra. Have you ever heard, heard of that? The frozen tundra? Yeah. Sophie, what about low temperature, high rainfall? Low temperature, high rainfall? Yeah. I'm going to say boreal forest. Low temperature, high rainfall? Uh, tropical rainfall. Doesn't exist. There's no such thing as low temperature or high rainfall because it's all snow and ice. No rain. Uh, Trick uh, question, uh, Sophie. Uh, Come on, yeah. No, I was just tricking her. What are we, do you know? Yeah, we're uh, forest. Tropical, tropical seasonal forest. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, because I heard you said it in my head. Quick, quick little video. Not so good video. Some parts of the Earth receive more heat from the sun. Earth's wind and ocean currents contribute to climate and balance the heat on Earth. Many scientists think human impacts on the atmosphere upset this balance. Winds are created as warm air rises and cool air sinks. Distinct global wind systems transport cold air to warm areas and warm air to cold areas. Ocean currents carry warm water towards the poles. As the water cools, it sinks toward the ocean floor and moves toward tropical regions. Earth's surface is warmed by the greenhouse effect. Certain gases in Earth's atmosphere, primarily water vapor, reduce the amount of energy Earth radiates into space. Other important greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide and methane. Humans have an impact on the atmosphere. The ozone layer is a protective layer in the atmosphere that absorbs most of the harmful UV radiation from the sun. Atmospheric studies have indicated that chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, contribute to a seasonal reduction in ozone concentration over Antarctica, forming the Antarctic ozone hole. The measured increase of carbon dioxide, or CO2, in the atmosphere is mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels. As carbon dioxide levels have increased, Average global temperature increased. Well, that's just some of the things, and that's one of the, the video that I was showing. Uh, uh, an inconvenient truth is about the global warming thing, which again we'll finish that later. Um, I, I, I like the, uh, the tools he uses. His teaching tools are nice. I'm thinking about getting a screen like that and 
Yeah, you know, it one of covers the whole world. The anyway, uh, this is the basic distribution because of all the weather pattern and such. This is the basic distribution of biomes on the Earth. This is taken from the AP book, but I think every it's not in your book, but I think everyone should see it. You can see this is the equator, and around the equator is where all the rainfall is. So you get a lot of uh, rainforest. That's the, the the green color here is the rainforest. You get a lot of that around the equator. Remember, I said the deserts are around 30 degrees north and south latitude. There's the 30 degree latitude line, and look, that's all desert. That's all desert. There's some desert a little further north there. And here you go, down south latitude, you got desert there, you got desert here, you got big desert here in Australia. So, um, there's the different weather patterns. You see the dark green where we are right there, that's um, tropical deciduous forest is what we call that. And, you're, and this, the AP book uses a little bit different terms than your book uses, but it's the same, it's the same weather pattern. So what we're going to do uh, is, uh, is talk about each one of these biomes briefly here. And I got a little short video clip showing you kind of what it looks like. And I think for your essay for next chapter, I'm pretty sure, if you get this chapter essay, you just write a little bit about each biome. Take like six biomes and write about them. And so what do we write about them? Well, the tundra. The tundra is really cold areas that uh, are in the summertime they get some grasses growing and in the wintertime it's just snow. It's places where they show polar bears running around. 15 to 25 centimeters of rain per year, that's not much. Temperature is cold, negative 34 to 12 Celsius. Wow. Outside here, um, 12 Celsius, that's, that's cold, that's like um, maybe... Uh, Maybe 50 degrees is as hot as it gets. South of the polar ice caps in the northern hemisphere, soggy summers, permafrost. Permafrost means below the surface, it stays frozen all year round. There's about that much surface soil, sometimes that much, and then below that it's just ice. You can't even stick a shovel through it. It's thick, thick ice that's real hard. Now, a drill, so drills can, you can drill through them, um, but imagine an ice pick, you know, hitting a big block of ice, it's hard. It's so hard that plant roots have trouble penetrating it, or can't penetrate it. So you never get big trees in the tundra, because trees need roots that go down deep to anchor them. So you don't get that. You get bushes and grasses is all that grows there. And during the winter, it's all covered in, in snow, and you can't see any of it. Here's where it is. Here's the location of the tundra. And here's a little video footage showing you kind of what it looks like. Tundra. Just to the south of the polar ice cap lies the tundra. This harsh environment is the home of caribou. Caribou graze on plants during the summer and on lichens in the winter. Polar bears live near the Arctic Ocean. They hunt seals and other animals for food. So look where that is. Northern Canada, Alaska, Greenland, Siberia, you know, Russia up there. That's tundra. Then you have what we call the boreal forest. It's also known as taiga. A little more rainfall now. Temperature's a little warmer, but still can get really cold. Northern part of North America, Europe, and Asia. These places, and here's where they're talking about here. Canada, up here. Huge coniferous forest. We call this taiga or boreal forest. Huge coniferous forest. Everywhere you look, big pine trees and spruce. Um, large forests that uh, have Needles, all the trees have needles, so they so the snow doesn't stay on the on the branches. Um, summers are short and moist. You do get some good rainfall, and especially when the when the snow melts, you get a lot of snow melt. Winters long, cold, and dry. 
we call this the taiga, or the boreal forest. The taiga, or northern coniferous forest, lies just south of the tundra and is characterized by large forests of spruce, fir, and pine trees. The dense shade provided by the evergreen trees prevents the growth of plants on the forest floor. The coniferous forests of the taiga are a major source of lumber around the world. Two members of the deer family, moose and elk, are common inhabitants of the taiga. Moose are found in northern forests worldwide, while elk are found only in North America, west of the Rocky Mountains. That's where the, most of the wood in the world comes from. I know we have some a forest around here that they cut with wood, and you look around, there's a lot of wood. But most of the wood comes from Canada and Russia. What's that one little strip in Canada? That... Here? Yeah. I think that's where the, I don't know, mountains? Rocky Mountains? Rocky Mountain. Uh, hi, hi. Okay, no? Sorry. I like that song. Who sings it? John Denver. I don't know. I was just. <laughs> um, the temperate forest. Uh, now we're getting further south, a, a warmer. Still getting cold in the winter, but a little warmer in the summertime. 30 Celsius is about what it is outside now. Um, more rainfall, 75 to 150 centimeters per year. North America, Eastern Asia, Australia, and Europe. Here's where we're talking about. Temperate forest. Some, uh, the AP book calls it temperate deciduous forest. Do you know what the word deciduous means? Yes. What's it mean? Uh, trees that should be Dropping your leaves, yeah. These trees drop their leaves. And we got a lot of pines around here that don't do that, but if you go up a little further north, most of the trees have these broad leaves and they drop them. And, uh, and that's what you see in the temperate forest. Well-defined seasons. Hot summers, cold winters. Lots of rainfall. Good for growing. Here's what a deciduous forest looks like. Temperate deciduous forests originally covered eastern North America, Europe, Japan, Australia, and South America. The dominant tree species in these forests include beech, maple, oak, and hickory. They are noted for losing their leaves each year before the cold winter months. Raccoons are nocturnal and appear to wash their food before eating. Deer and fox are other common inhabitants of northern deciduous forests. But the reason why they lose their leaves is so the snow won't stay on them and break the branches. So when it turns cold, they just drop the leaves. And then the, the winters are pretty short in these areas, so the next year they'll just grow new leaves. The leaves decompose right around the roots, so a lot of the nutrients are sucked back up by the same. Temperate woodland and shrubland. Let's see where this is. Temperate woodland and shrubland is the blue, light blue areas. And you see a lot of it around the Mediterranean here. Australia. On the west coast. Yeah, Australia. Basically lots of shrubs. Um, some trees. But the rainfall is lower in temperate woodland and shrubland. Uh, the temperature's a little warmer. Um, here we go. Summers are very hot and dry. Winters are cool and wet. So you have, uh, you have some wet seasons here. And I don't have video footage of that. I have some pictures, I should put them in here, of me hiking in the chaparral in, in California, these shrubs, just shrubs everywhere, little bushes and trees that don't get much bigger than that, and they're just everywhere. Awesome. What about a grassland? Um, that is wrong. 
they've tied that wrong. I don't know what that's supposed to be, but it should be a lower number. Um, grasslands have a rainy season. Um, you got you get a lot of fires going through the grasslands. Have you ever seen uh, the movie The Lion King? The the, the savannas. Yeah. Um, they're similar, but not quite as much grass. You see, we got a lot of them in North America. We have in the grassland. You have very fertile soil. This is where most of the farms in the world are. One of America's biggest exports is food. Did you know that? Yes. We grow a lot of the food for the world and then ship it out and sell it to other people. Because we have most of the grasslands and that's where most of the farms are. We should bring the lions over. No, we do not need to bring the lions. Oh, we we should bring lions. Grasslands are typically found in the interiors of continents. These lands provide a natural pasture for herds of Quite grazing least. animals such as bison and antelope. The soils of grasslands are very fertile due to the growth and decay of many plants. Burrowing animals such as prairie dogs, rabbits, and gophers are common in temperate grasslands. Deserts! You can guess what a desert is. Hot, low rainfall. All the plants there protect their water. They have spines and such. Um, and there's not as many plants. And here again you see it's about 30 degrees north and south latitude. Some places there's so little water that nothing grows and it's just sand. And then you have your savannas. This was the Lion King one. Savannas are kind of like grasslands. Very similar temperatures and rainfalls. Um, That's what we need. Uh, we, there, you get a lot of these savannas, here's where they're located, look at Africa, most of Africa is savanna. You get a lot of grazing animals going around eating um, what they can and then you get the predators that follow those animals around eating the, the weak ones and the slow ones. Um, so that's the Lion King stuff. Summer's hot and rainy, winter's cool and dry. And then the, uh, skip up to the tropical rainforest. This is probably the most famous biome because, number one, since it gets the most rainfall and it's hot near the equator, it, uh, it has the most living species in it. There are more living species in the tropical rainforest than all the other biomes combined. And all these species are going extinct because tropical rainforest is being cut down very quickly. Because most tropical rainforest exists in places that have poor, bad economies. And they cut down the rainforest and sell the wood and try and farm. And the soil in a rainforest is very poor. You wouldn't think that. You'd think rainforest must have real rich soil. But that's not correct because all the plants that grow pull all the nutrients out of the soil and into their bodies. And so all the nutrients exist above ground. So when they cut the area and clear it and try and plant crops on it, there's no nutrients in the soil. And they call that slash and burn farming. Have you ever heard of it? They slash all the forests, they burn them up, plant, uh, plant crops and they won't grow. And so they go on to the next place and slash it burn it and try and plant crops. They and they only grow they're they only able to grow crops for about a year, so the, the forests are quickly disappearing. Why don't they just let all the stuff that cut down deep as well as it takes too long. How long? Too long. Twenty or thirty years for good decomposition. They don't have that long. They gotta plant crops now. They got starving people there. So the the rainforests are quickly disappearing. There's a great movie about rainforests uh, medicine Man right here. Sophie's got it. I got it. Sophie's got it. Somebody's renting the movies and not I want sure. it. Right. No, I just rented it today. Oh, okay. Here's what it looks like in the tropical rainforest. The widest diversity of life forms in the world can be found in the tropical rainforest that exist in areas near the equator. 
The vegetation in these forests is extremely thick due to the more than 200 centimeters of rain these areas receive annually. The animal life of a rainforest includes three-toed sloths that move slowly and silently through the canopy and hang upside down from the branches with their long hook-like claws. Monkeys swing easily from tree to tree searching for fruits and seeds. Jaguars prowl the forest floor in search of a small mammal for a meal. Most of the medicines we get in the world are from the rainforest. Plants make them. I went to the rainforest in 2000, I think. And uh, in Ecuador, which I'll show you where that is. Whoops. 2001. These are pictures. We don't have time to go through these, but um, if you take AP bio, I'll show them all to you after the exam is done. But uh, Ecuador is down in South America, on the equator there. And we hiked up into this rainforest. This is our group. And uh, you can see it was a group of students and teachers. And we went up there, and these, these forests are just, this, this is a path getting to the forest. They're just real lush. That's me hanging out by a little light. And these, here we are in the forest doing some bird watching. That guy in the blue hat was a fam kind of famous bird watcher. There's a bird. They had horses up running around the forest. What? I'll try and show this to you later. It's pretty interesting. You got to read 30. You got to read 3.1 and 2. If you didn't read 3.1 already, Willis O U T. Out.